Good afternoon. The good news is I'll try not to duplicate anything that the, my predecessor just said. On the basis, it's all very complicated, and bluntly at the moment, we're still not quite sure what some of it means. But um, so I'll skip over a number of the things that uh, um, I was planning to say uh, on the basis that, that they were already being covered. One of the differences between ourselves and the ICO is um, we're already involved in cybersecurity. Essentially, because of our overall role in, in telecommunications, indeed, you actually. This, let's get this absolutely right. Electronic communications network and services um, derived from the European framework. We have an um, involvement in broader security obligations that goes back to 2011. Um, cyber, we've long considered to be part of that, but it's now getting a lot more intention from us and indeed others, partly because of an increasing perceived and real threat, partly because of the government's own cyber strategy, which you, you're no doubt all aware of. And that's really evidenced by a number of things. And this is one of them, but also um, on a sort of voluntary basis, we're, we've got involved with DCMS in something called TBEST, which I will just spend a moment talking about. Um, but broadly, our obligations and our powers derive from Section 105A to D of the Communications Act, as referred to earlier on. Um, these require communication providers to take measures appropriately to manage risk and security, to report incidents to us, just as was described in the context of NIS. Um, our role is issuing and updating guidance, ditto. Following up and investigating reported incidents and any other concerns as needed, ditto. Publishing a summary, ditto. And enforcement, ditto. So essentially all the things that are covered by NIS we're already doing in related areas. Um, by all means, look at the interactive dashboard. That's actually on our website and derived from a report that we publish on an annual basis called the, uh, sorry, the Connected Nations Report. And it outlines the sort of incidents that are currently being reported to us. As you can see, predominantly they're to do with hardware and power. Uh, indeed, most of the hardware is actually power supply failure. So the reality is it's all the stuff you'd expect to see. And as you can probably notice, cyber features nowhere on that list. So the reality is almost all of the incidents that we deal with at the moment I've got nothing to do with cyber issues. I spoke about TBEST. Now, TBEST is much more proactive. This is a scheme that's modelled on what's already going on in the finance sector. Again, as my, as my uh, uh, colleague from the ICO said, that the finance sector in cybersecurity terms is already fairly well look, looked at. I think uh, governments not just in the UK, but more broadly, decided quite a long time ago that they couldn't rely upon the banks sorting it out themselves. So the Bank of England in particular has a very explicit role in making sure that the financial markets work effectively. Uh, and as part of that, they introduced something called CBIST a number of years ago. Um, and that's really got a proven track record of, of essentially finding out in real terms how vulnerable um, banks infrastructure is to cyber attacks by essentially doing threat intelligence led penetration testing on the real live networks. Essentially what um, government wants to see happen is that the same approach is actually um, transposed to other sectors and the telecom sector is leading on it. There's been some DCMS uh, led trial schemes and there's, there's, there's a couple of communication providers who already um, had this uh, process um, applied to them. We're involved in that process at the moment as, as, as part of the, the, the team uh, and, and the current proposal is that we, we will take over responsibility for it in due course as part of our broader cyber and, and network security resilience responsibilities and apply it more broadly across the communication provider sector. Now in this context I will say there's an awful lot of providers of electronic communication networks and services in the UK are we necessarily going to apply this to all of them immediately? Obviously not. We don't have the resources to, to actually do that. We're going to look at this on a phased basis. And the reality is <clears throat> it'll be the larger ones who, who, who are our priority. NIS. OK, I'm not going to go through any of this really any, in, in particular detail. It's already been dealt with. Um, our responsibilities, as been said already, are to, to do with um, the digital infrastructure elements. Um, 
And this is where really my presentation turns into an ask. Um, I think we've got a slightly different perspective on this from the, from the ICO. Um, the, the reality is we were already in contact with a fair proportion of the, the, the major communication providers in the UK. But our specific responsibilities under NIS are, are quite specific. And they do bring in a whole bunch of people that uh, are new to us and, and new to dealing with, with us. So we've already published guidance. There's a link there you can follow. Uh, and that explains how we are proposing to go about doing things. Um, the NIST directive legislation, should you want to, is also available, but uh, it's not necessarily something I would specifically recommend. But in that legislation and in our guidance, we do set some thresholds <coughs> um, which we expect people to self-declare against. So there is actually a timetable, which basically is next week, that requires people who are in scope to declare them themselves to us, uh, and that will... Uh, then lead us to doing a number of things going forward, some of which are actually pro quite proactive. We, we will engage with the people that are, we think are in scope and require them to satisfy us that they're doing things properly. Now, what I've got up there is, is, is two links. One is to a, a generic um, email box that um, is capable of just accepting um, uh, requests for background information, but also the name of one of my colleagues, Mike Lee, who's leading our stakeholder engagement on this, who will be more than happy to talk to anybody in this room or indeed more, more broadly about this, these whole set of issues. What are the thresholds and who, who does this apply to? Essentially, there are three sectors. Um, to name, name registries, or top level to name, name registries, um, DNS providers uh, and IXPs. The trigger points are noted here. Uh, the threshold specified is an annual average in terms of um, registry queries, uh, DNS resolvers, publicly accessible, again, um, an average of two, two million or more requesting DNS clients based in the UK in 24 hours. So it's, you know, it's, it's quite a, that's somewhat a higher threshold to, to some degree. But es essentially, they should be self-explanatory. If you think you're caught by any of these, let us know. You know. We've already identified, I think, a long list of people that we think should be contacted us. And bluntly, at the moment, there's not enough of you coming forward, and we do actually need to engage with you one way or the other. At that point, I will make one more comment, uh, and that's really going back on a point that I think the, that the ICO touched on earlier, which is this issue of what's the cutoff for uh, a UK-based um, um, enterprise. Now, I think our position at the moment is a bit more nuanced. I think we are already coming to the conclusion that, for instance, in the DNS environment, indeed, uh, top-level to name, name registries, we'll probably need to include some providers who have got UK facilities, even though they're not UK-based. So I think we've already come to the conclusion that we're going to have to spread our net a little bit broader. At that point, I will end and say, any questions? Questions for you? Okay, thanks, you.